Hello everyone. Today we're going to go into whether CDC misled the public on the efficacy of Pfizer BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine, specifically on the report from Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl Atkinson broke the news of Representative Massey, who read this report. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices Interim Recommendation for Use of Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 Vaccines. We're going to get back to that report, but first, let's hear from Cheryl in this discussion that was recorded a few days ago. Cheryl Atkinson is a five-time Emmy Award winner and a Radio Television Digital News Association Edward R. Moreau Award recipient. She was formerly an investigative correspondent in the Washington Bureau for CBS News and an anchor for the CBS Evening News. The nonpartisan Sunday TV program, Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson, is broadcast to 43 million Sinclair TV households on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, CW, and Telemundo stations. Her work, her investigative journalism, of which there's far too little left in the United States, can be found at CherylAtkinson.com and FullMeasure.News. I have Cheryl Atkinson on a breaking science because CDC claimed in their non-peer-reviewed morbidity or mortality weekly report that the coronavirus vaccine had proven equally safe and effective in all age groups, races, and whether a person had been previously diagnosed with COVID-19 or not. A representative Massey had called the CDC to specifically inquire about how they reported that people who had previously been diagnosed with COVID-19 had the same efficacy as was reported for the rest of the population when the data that they actually showed did not support that. At first, they tried to say that it was a mistake that they missed. They thanked him profusely for his eagle eye and promised to bring the problem to the authors of the report. Uh, Representative Massey found that the report was not updated and no erratum was issued. So they then tried to say that the statement was not technically wrong if one ignores the efficacy in the subgroup of people who already had COVID-19 and merely focus instead on overall efficacy describing that group as people with and without prior infection. Uh, a Dr. Oliver argued that what we wouldn't want to put out there that if you had COVID before you shouldn't get the vaccine. And Massey had pointed out that there could be problems with people getting the vaccine after having COVID-19, uh, specifically restricting his concerns to wasted resources. And Oliver promised to look into tweaking the language a little bit. After Representative Massey brought the issue to Dr. Cohen and Dr. Oliver, they nevertheless went on a video, made a video for the medical community, providing key information to the medical community on efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines. And they actually orchestrated a posed question on whether the vaccine was appropriate for people who already had COVID-19. And the answer that was given was that the science showed, the study showed, across all groups, including all racial and ethnic groups, that the vaccine was 95% efficacious, including those, for, including those people who had already had COVID-19. Well, Representative Massey contacted CDC again, and they tried to argue that it would just be confusing to fix the problem, uh, including CDC Principal Deputy Director Shuket, who said that they preferred instead to use plain language in the end, Shook had apologized and said that the problem was not intentional. The misstatements were not intentional. Uh, the CDC's final response was to restate the erroneous misinterpretation of the science simply playing word games. So Cheryl, this is a rather stunning series of uh, conversations that, for which Massey uh, recorded and brought to you and you brought it out in your reporting. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Well, not the recorded conversations, but I will tell you with my two decades of experience covering issues with CDC, this form of double talking 
the intentional obfuscation, the trying to explain that up is down, up is down, up is down, until you're weary of having the argument. I'm very familiar with that. But what was different here is that Congressman Massey, who himself has a scientific background, could not easily be double talked the way I think some reporters or congressional staffers might be able to if they're not so familiar with, with these tactics. Um, I think Congressman Massey called them psyops tactics that CDC is well trained to use against people who question the message that they're putting out, particularly when it's contrary. And in this case, provably, factually, undeniably contrary to the facts. And then I think what was what would be surprising to a lot of people is they they acknowledged that it was wrong and still refused to correct it. So there's no doubt that this was an intentional mistake designed by whom, you know, or for what purpose you can use your own imagination or thoughts on that. But yeah, it was just having the recordings with the tacit admissions, having the subsequent reportings of the CDC doctors that you mentioned, Oliver and Cohn, still repeating the false information, claiming efficacy in a study that did not show that. Um, you know, it's, it should be shocking to people who aren't familiar with the way CDC sometimes operates. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is this is really gaining some steam. Senator Rand Paul tweeted out that the CDC was caught in a lie. Uh, you know, uh, you, you made a very clear analogy, and I appreciated it very much as one who teaches science, uh, that if, you know, you were surveying people on whether they love spinach and all the kids said no, but you reported that some high percentage of people who love spinach is reported to apply to all the people in the survey, knowing that the subgroup of children who 100% rated that they do not love spinach, that you're simply misleading. You've had an admixed population. It's a very well known problem in science. And uh, Massey's really quickly becoming one of my favorite guys. My favorite quote from him, given what we, what we know about uh, CDC and how they obfuscate and use double speak and all the rest from his recorded conversations with CDC when he was speaking with Shukit, he said, listen, you know, uh, he understood that there were what he called two regimes, public policy and science. Now, if you pause on that for a moment, this is a congressional representative telling a very senior person, she's like third in command at CDC, and uh, that, that he recognizes and understands that the MO at CDC is that there is a difference between public policy and science. There's two regimes. Um, but then he admonished them and he said, you know, the CDC cannot simply make up results that don't exist and then mislead the public. And what's most astonishing of all is that she just let that go. She never said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? There's not two regimes. There's public policy is based on science. She never challenged him on the existence of two regimes. Did you catch that? Yes. And, you know, he said that a few different ways in his conversations. And he's pointing out that he knows CDC has conflicts of interest. On the one hand, they're supposed to monitor vaccine safety. At the same time, they're trying to press everybody, I use that sort of in quotes, but everybody to get vaccinated with a particular vaccine. And of course, they are very much in line with the vaccine industry in terms of goals. And they're linked, you know, in some cases, personalities through the revolving door financially. So he, he's, explicitly saying, if you listen to the recordings, I know you want everybody to get this vaccine. <laughs> and that's your business if that's the kind of you know, public policy you put forward, but you can't do that by citing false information and making up science, which is exactly what they did. Yeah, these are very serious questions also. One of the things that he didn't bring up was that um, there was an Asian result um, in the same table as the people who had previously had COVID-19, which had a non-significant small negative efficacy but the asian result showed that the vaccine was only 42 i think percent uh, effective in that subgroup and that was powered enough to be able to be significant and significantly different from 95 percent i'm sure um and you know I, do you think that he was you know treading lightly on some of the more um Com um, confrontational or uh, controversial, I should say, uh, consequences of CDC uh, basing their recommendations or public policy on science that does not exist or ignoring science that they have in hand? Well, I think his goal, and I think he was as surprised anybody to stumble across this information, 
he was looking for himself whether he should get vaccinated after he'd had COVID. He read the studies. He saw there was no efficacy for people like him. And then he ran across the um, CDC statement that claimed otherwise. So I don't think he, his goal was, I got the impression not to parse the details of the study and the representations. It was the very specific one that impacts people who've had coronavirus before and also the vaccine supply at a time when they're saying there are many shortages. Why would you want those for whom it's not proven effective to be gobbling up precious vaccine from people who presumably need it far more? And I would add to that, of course, that all medicines have side effects. These vaccines can have quite um, common and severe side effects if you're frail in particular. And why would you want somebody for whom there's no efficacy proven or no effectiveness proven in the studies to take that risk of the side effects without any proven benefit while there's a vaccine shortage? So I yeah, think those are the initial questions he was he was concerned with. And I don't think, I don't know, we'd have to ask him, but I don't think he examined the whole study and, and dug into the racial representations and so on. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, I would totally agree that, that that's that's up for him to describe for himself. The uh, My concern is that people that had been previously had COVID-19 may be more susceptible to serious adverse events getting the vaccine for a number of reasons. There's been a number of hypotheses. I published one way back in April of 2020 um, called pathogenic priming, where the vaccine itself may cause some people to have a overreactive reactogenic uh, response to their own proteins through molecular mimicry. You know, Cheryl, I published a list of proteins and the tissues in which they're expressed where the immunogenetic epitopes that are found in the SARS-CoV-2 virus, including the spike protein, matched human proteins. And it's, it's kind of uh, haunting to think back in April that I actually predicted that there was a protein that if a person had been exposed to coronavirus uh, vaccine and then the infection or vice versa, that could have, if it was not included in the vaccine, it may have actually prevented the Florida doctor's death who died of thrombocytopenia. This is the kind of world that I'm living in. I'm looking at it saying, yeah, we kind of could have stopped this if we took those unsafe epitopes out. So, um, well, well, I'm looking go ahead. into some of those topics. I should be public publishing a story on this, and I hope in the next couple of days, because there is research showing, you know, exactly what you said your research had shown, and that is that people who've had coronavirus are are seeming to have more common and more severe side effects from these RNA vaccines in a way that's measurable. And so I, I asked CDC about this, by the way, and they said they are looking into those reports, but there is published material now, other published material referring to the same thing. Yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the same thing. And that's why that's part of what we're gonna roll into this report. Uh, you know, you, your perspectives on this, your experience, your dogged determination matched by uh, Congressman Massey's, your objectivity, Cheryl, you know, it's a beacon. The last question that I have for you on this is a more general question. Given the type of objective journalist you are with the integrity that you carry, the sad state of journalism in the United States must be a sore disappointment for you. Can you talk talk about that? Well, it's disappointing and it's, it's somewhat frightening because at least the media, as I thought of it, the news media, used to be the great equalizer because we expected that corporations and political figures and other powerful interests might put out one side of a story or might make false claims or might do things that are not in our best interest. But the media was there to try to push out the truth and look at another side and make sure we had full information. That, that dynamic really doesn't exist to any meaningful degree anymore. And it's really deteriorated. You know, the, the slow burn has been traced in my books um, stonewalled, slanted, my new book, and the smear, my last book. But the acceleration of this trend over the past four years, and particularly in the past, you know, let's say six months, is really shocking. And it's not good for anybody. It's not good for journalism. It's not good for the public. I, I suppose, well, I'll amend that statement. It's good for the powerful interests who want to be sure we don't have access to certain information. That's the only, the only people who benefit. So yeah, yeah it's a disappointing time for my industry and you know I hope I hope we find a way out 
or we find a new paradigm that comes of this new technology where we can't be deplatformed and silenced and censored when we're simply reporting the facts. But um, that's that remains to be seen. Uh, you know, I tell everybody, turn off your TV and go, to, go over and watch Cheryl Atkinson. She's got the most objective position in media that I know of. Um, you, you're very, very studied and, and talented in telling the story without um, going over the top and letting the listener or viewer draw their own conclusions. Part of my goal, Cheryl, is to try to help depoliticize the, pro the, the, the public health and depoliticize our, our, our health. Our health, of course, being a, a last mining commodity that major industry has figured out how to make the most money out of. But, uh, you know, I, I just want to congratulate you on, on your efforts in that same vein to depoliticize this as much as possible. It's remarkable that, um, and I hate to say it because I'm apolitical, but I'm, it's remarkable that I predict that we will never find a, 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 a liberal Democrat inquiring of the CDC how they mess this up in public. I just, I don't see that happening. So thank you so much, Cheryl Atkinson, and continue on your great journey. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you giving a uh, voice to the story because I think it's really important. Absolutely. So I'm going to be posting the links to all, all of your books and we're going to roll to a, a, a greater episode. Um, and so if you have anything else you'd like me to share, Cheryl, Cheryl, just send it over to me and I'll make sure to link it to it. Okay. All right. So that was uh, amazing uh, to spend that time with Cheryl Atkinson talking about this. And I want to point everyone, of course, over to full measure uh, dot news. This is her um, website. This is where she publishes objective in-depth investigative reporting in the United States. She's one of the last ones, last ones standing. Uh, ben Swan, of course, uh, Del Big Tree and the team at the High Wire. Uh, but uh, Cheryl deserves a round of applause and she deserves your attention. She's on the CDC uh, helping Representative Massey uh, bring this forward. She broke this story, so she deserves the credit for that. And very gracious of her to spend time with me. So I want to point the Unbreaking Science followers to this report, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices Interim Recommendation for the Use of Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 Vaccine, uh, the United States, December 2020. They even highlighted on their pap on the page here that the efficacy um, is the same with or without evidence of previous uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. But at the top, you'll notice that there's been an erratum that was published, and this is the erratum here. I want to take you to that. If you click on that, then you'll see the erratum. And the erratum, actually, <laughs> Representative Massey is very, very uh, confused, and I would say frustrated with the fact that after calling them out and saying, listen, the data actually show zero efficacy if you've already had the COVID-19 vaccine. Why are you advising medical doctors to continue to tell their patients that if they've had COVID-19 vaccine to go ahead and get the vaccine? Here's CDC's erratum. It's still published today. I just checked it this morning, 22121. Although numbers of observed hospitalizations and deaths were low, the available data were consistent with the reduced risk for these severe outcomes, meaning hospitalization and deaths due to COVID-19 infection among vaccinated persons compared with those among placebo recipients. Absolutely incorrect. That is an unwarranted false claim published. They doubled down, is how Dr. Uh, uh, Mas uh, Re Representative Massey uh, referenced it. Now, if anyone has been following what's been happening to IPAC, where I'm the CEO and the director, you will notice that the fact checkers are all over me. Fact checkers are all over me for daring to be the editor in chief of a journal that I actually oversaw the peer review of a study by Dr. Henry Ely and colleagues that they wrote. This is their study. It is not an IPAC study showing that CDC is not reporting proper numbers of deaths from COVID-19. And the fact checkers are all over me. We made it to USA Today, we AFP 
news, whatever, fact check, uh, PolitiFact, and so on. Um, why aren't they tackling this? Here is an absolutely incorrect claim. The CDC has made false claims about the efficacy of Pfizer's vaccine. If you've had coronavirus, we know if you've been listening to Unbreaking Science and paying attention to my own research that there's a distinct possibility of serious outcomes after you are vaccinated. <clears throat> if you then are exposed to the wild virus, either through pathogenic priming or through a specific mechanism of which path of a type of pathogenic priming known as antibody de dependent enhancement. Um, and so I guess the ask here is to contact the last person, contact Principal Deputy, uh, Deputy Director and shook it at the CDC and let her know that you're dissatisfied with the CDC's performance and contact the director of the HHS and let them know and refer them to Cheryl's amazing uh, report. You can see that on fullmeasurenews.com and you can listen to uh, or read Cheryl's own story of the slanting of news in America, the smear, uh, how the new media, the news media taught us to love censorship and hate journalism. And you can also read about uh, her own personal experience with int intimidation and harassment. Her, her computers were bugged. They put files on there that shouldn't be there. Uh, her book is, was a New York Times bestseller, Stonewall. Um, both of them were New York Times bestsellers. So it's that's the story today, folks. Uh, check it out. Go to Full Measure News um, and listen to this entire episode right here. This is this is where it is. You'll see the whole thing there. The controversy began when Massey noticed the CDC was claiming the exact opposite. CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices had just issued a high-profile report authored by 15 scientists. It wrongly claimed Pfizer's study proved the vaccine is highly effective or showed consistent high efficacy for people who'd already had coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. It says the exact opposite of what the data says. They're giving people the impression that this vaccine will save your life, even, or, or you know, save you from suffering, even if you've already had the virus and recovered, which is- All right, so that's it, there we go. So Full Measure News, go check it out. Uh, Dr. Jack, uh, always bringing you uh, the most relevant and important things that I can dig into. I want to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode. We have a fantastic interview with uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock coming up. We have that to look forward to, as well as a fascinating interview on the retraction of scientific papers. And so that's coming up on Unbreaking Science. Watch for them, and I'll see you next time.